Hello, I am Michael Collins and this is Media Focus. In this video, we are going to be looking at the theories of Paul Gilroy and we're going to have an attempt at applying them to the music video to Formation by Beyonce. In particular, we are going to be looking at the representation of black people in this video and we are going to be considering how they're represented in this way and why they're being represented in this way. In order to understand the music video to Formation, not only do we need to understand Paul Gilroy's theory, but also we need to understand some of the context around Formation. We need to consider why it is that black people are being represented in this way and exactly what it is that Beyonce and her producers are attempting to say in this music video as well. So, first of all, let's just go through Paul, Gil Paul Gilroy very, very quickly. So, Paul Gilroy is the key theory number 11, if you're keeping count, and we attribute theories around ethnicity and post-colonial theory to him uh, in this exam specification. So just very, very quickly and kind of a very straightforward, in a nutshell, description of Paul Gilroy, there's two big ideas that we need to consider. The first is that black and minority ethnic people are often presented and represented as an other in media products. Now, when we use the term other, we mean not the same. We mean different. And when Gilroy uses the term other, he means other than white. And this is something which is really, really important to get across. He also posits that black people are often represented as criminals and are generally represented as a binary opposition to civilised white characters. And if you want to look at a few examples of this, do check out a previous video that I made, which is on applying theories related to black and minority ethnic people to media products, where we go through Gilroy in a little bit of detail. And also we look at the theorist Manuel Alvarado and also Stuart Hall as well for more examples of stereotyping and othering as well. The other concept which is really, really important to Gilroy is this idea of post-colonialism. For Gilroy, the United Kingdom and also the United States, no idea why I did those funky brackets there, uh, are struggling to shake off their colonial past. This leads to this nostalgic and reductive ideological perspective that we all often see in media products. This idea of looking back to a better time when things were different, but also often when things were much, much worse for black and minority ethnic characters as well. By looking back, Gilroy argues, uh, this reinforces ideas that white people and black people are represented as very, very different. So what is colonialism? Well, this map here gives you an indication of the kind of thing I'm talking about. The countries which are shaded in red are British colonies, or former British colonies. And as we can see, the, uh, the British Isles uh, colonised a number of countries across the world. So here we can see India, Australia uh, and Canada as well have all been colonised. Uh, and also a large swathe of African countries going right down there from the north right down to South Africa. So there are obviously many issues with this idea of colonization, this idea of marching into a country and saying, well, you know, you belong to me now. I own you now, raises lots and lots of issues when it comes to systems of hierarchy. And this is something that we have mentioned before in these videos, this idea of telling somebody, okay, you now follow our queen, you now worship our religion, reinforces this idea that every other country in the world has an inferior ideology to the British Isles. And that in order to save them, Essentially, uh, British people need to go off and need to take charge because they're quite clearly incapable of looking after themselves, which is obviously a very, very upsetting notion. Now, why was this the case? Well, especially in the case of Africa, one of the main reasons for colonisation was the procurement of slave labour. 
Um, just a couple of facts here, which I have pinched from The Guardian, an article in 2015. It wasn't until 1807, so just uh, 200 years ago, when uh, British Parliament passed the Abolition of the Slave Trade Act which is affected throughout the British Empire. But actually, it wasn't until 1838 that slavery itself was actually abolished in British colonies, which gave all slaves in the British Empire the freedom. About 12.5 million people were transported as slaves from Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean between the 16th century and 1807 which is obviously an absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous number of people who were completely displaced and when the slavery abolition act was passed there were 46,000 slave owners in britain according to the slave compensation committee uh, committee the government body established to evaluate the claims of slave owners this idea that slavery is purely an American problem is simply not true, because if we consider who actually colonized and who actually settled in America, it was a range of different people from Europe. So, slavery, how did it happen? Obviously, the idea seems completely ridiculous, abhorrent and disgusting to everyone watching this video right now. This particularly unpleasant image here is from a an academic book from the uh, 19th century a british academic book from the 19th century well what ideological perspectives does the creator of this image have so we see three different kinds of people here when i say people the last is a completely different species so we see a greek person the skull and the designation Apollo Belvedere. Then we see a black person designated with the racist term Negro and uh, Creole Negro uh, labeling the skull there. And then at the bottom, we have a completely different species, a young chimpanzee. Now, of course, we know now, and quite frankly, we knew then that apes and humans were completely different species. Everybody knew this. And quite frankly, you know this as well, because, you know, I want to go into this in too, too much detail. Uh, any human can have a baby with another human. We cannot have children with animals. So completely different species here. However, what is the argument being made in this image? Well, the argument being made is that white people and black people are completely different species. This is an example of what we call a racial hierarchy and an example of othering. And obviously, it's a particularly extreme example. Now, if the science is so bad and can instantly be refuted by me, somebody without a science background and frankly knows nothing about science, then why was this idea so popular? Well, the cold hard fact here is that it justified this idea of slavery. This idea of saying, well, different humans are of different races, and they're very, very different, and therefore they can and should be treated in different ways, uh, reinforces this idea that black people and white people are different. And not only are they different, but they occupy different roles within a hierarchy. If we can argue that black people are different from white people, then it can also be argued that it's okay to enslave them, which is obviously a nonsense argument, which is based on bad science. So what societal benefits are there to establishing racial hierarchies and the othering of ethnic minorities? Well, for Gilroy, the most important thing here, beyond... Uh, trying to create an ideology that slavery is acceptable, is that this reinforces and establishes a form of hegemonic control. Hegemony is the process of following rules through coercion and consent, as opposed to forcing it onto people. These are the rules that we follow every day. Now, if it can be established within a society that there is a hierarchy and that certain people are on the top, and certain people are on the bottom. And if it could be established through scientific literature and through popular literature and also through popular discourse as well, and if this keeps on getting repeated over and over again, this will reinforce and cultivate dominant hegemonic values. So we are left with this repulsive and repugnant notion 
that white people are better and superior to black people. In fact, the actual term race comes from this idea of racist science. And to be quite honest, we probably shouldn't even be using these terms. People are people. Binary oppositions can also help people to make sense of the world as well. This idea, for example, for a British person in the 19th century, it helps people to make sense of the world if you're told that your country is the best in the world, that your country is better than every other country in the world, and that actually people from other countries are nowhere near as good as you, and quite frankly, that they should be working for you for free for the rest of their lives. So this binary opposition can also help people to make sense of the world. And we can see how racists can easily fall into this trap, can easily fall into this idea. One of the reasons why racism and an ideology can be so attractive to certain people is it makes the world very, very simple. And of course, we need to avoid these extremely simplistic and disgusting interpretations. So what does this have to do with formation? Well, I'm getting there. But quite clearly, formation does deal with this idea of racism. Formation also deals with this idea of slavery in the American South in the 19th century. Probably the most famous depiction of slavery in the American South during the 19th century is in the 1939 film Gone with the Wind, directed by Victor Fleming. In this film, starring Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara, uh, we have this four-hour-long epic, this riches-to-rags-to-riches-again story about a young woman and her family, uh, and essentially the fall of the Confederacy in the South of America, and their attempts to survive and to live after the forces from the North of America come in and essentially emancipate and liberate their slaves. Taken from today's context, Gone with the Wind is obviously deeply problematic. And although it is a fascinating and often very exciting film as well, the ideology behind it can be extremely unpleasant to watch with modern eyes. Perhaps the most problematic aspect of Gone with the Wind is the character of Mammy, played by Hattie McDaniel. Mammy is a stereotype of a black woman that we very, very rarely see in media products today. She is large, she speaks completely differently to the rest of the characters in a very stereotypical way. She is not as intelligent as the other characters, and this is something which is reinforced throughout as she herself admits it. She will frequently go on and on and on about how black people are insuperior to white people, thus reinforcing this idea of racial binaries and othering. She is fiercely loyal to the O'Hara family. And even after the slaves of the American South are liberated, she continues to work for them, even when she's not being paid for it and she could have left. This idea of this wise, uh, because she is indeed wise, although she doesn't talk in the sophisticated way of her owners. But this idea of a wise black person who is unfailingly loyal to them is a stereotype which is often presented in literature of the time. And of course, it is problematic from today's perspective. Here we see Hattie McDaniel doing up Scarlett O'Hara's... Uh, What's this called? Corset, which again reinforces this idea of a racial hierarchy. She consistently works for the O'Hara family, bending over backwards for them in every single last situation. This reinforces the idea of dominance and of hierarchies as well. But it also reinforces this idea that this is perfectly acceptable. Even when she has the chance to flee and leave, she doesn't. And she is rewarded with her loyalty to the family. Even though the film was produced many years after slavery was abolished, the film is frankly quite um, sympathetic towards slavery and is resolutely racist in its representation of black people. 
Another thing we also need to consider with the film Gone with the Wind is its very, very specific costumes, which are also made reference to in formation as well. We call this era the antebellum era, and these very, very elaborate dresses, uh, which were worn by the white slave owners, are both wonderful and extravagant, but also have very significant uh, symbolic connotations of slavery and of racial hierarchies as well. And it is this very symbol which is presented time and time again in the video to formation. In this mid shot here, we see Beyonce staring directly at the camera. Her facial expression connotes not only her confidence, but also her displeasure in perhaps seeing the audience, but also perhaps being in this situation as well. The lighting of the shot is low key, which demonstrates and emphasizes the shadows, perhaps presenting a binary opposition between black and white. The white of her costume again presents a binary opposition with the black of her skin as well, further reinforcing this binary. However, quite clearly, Beyonce is not a slave owner in this video, and she's surrounded with images of black slaves behind her. This idea can be explained by the idea of cultural appropriation. By wearing the costume of her oppressors, Beyonce is taking this symbol and is taking over control of it. She is acknowledging the idea and the very reality of black slavery in the South of America. But through taking control of these elaborate and beautiful antebellum dresses, it allows her to reconfigure and to take it in a completely different way. These kind of shots as well also demonstrate the poverty and the issues which still exist in South America south of america to this very day and this shot here taken from an american news broadcast in the aftermath of hurricane katrina really emphasizes the inequality which still exists in america this shot here was very much inspired the whole of the video to formation which presents this very much this cinema verite collection of different shots so there's a couple of words we can use here for what formation is doing so first of all cinema verite is literally the cinema of truth and this was an artistic movement where essentially lots and lots of different footage uh, and lots of different styles of footage would be combined together in order to present a really exciting collage for the audience. So combining documentary style footage with narrative style footage, this idea that the audience couldn't distinguish between whether or not they're seeing a documentary. And this is something which the music video to formation does very well, especially in the sense that it actually takes footage from an actual documentary, i.e. that B-E-A-T uh, by Anton Bagheri. This footage was uh, taken without his permission, however, he doesn't actually own the rights to the documentary, so technically it was completely okay. Another concept we can also use to refer to formation is, and again, this is another French term, the idea of bricolage. Bricolage is, again, the taking of different elements and placing them together. And this is something which formation does by jumping backwards and forwards in time from the aftermath from Hurricane Katrina and then jumping back in time to the antebellum era, Beyonce is demonstrating to the audience that these issues still exist within American society and that there exists a very, very real binary opposition between black and white people. And there exists a very, very real racial hierarchy that exists. So what binary oppositions are there in formation? How do they use ethnicity? So just a couple of examples, of course, we have Beyonce here in the antebellum dress. We have her in this house and the mise-en-scene here very much is symbolic and is very much suggestive of a white slave owner in the 1800s. These ideas might be potentially controversial or even offensive to her black target audience. And it's quite clear that she's really, really pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable in this music video. 
this idea of binary oppositions is also reinforced through the later dance routines, which also take place in this antebellum era house. And again, as we can see in the lower shot here, she is once more wearing an antebellum style dress, but it's been changed. It's been made more contemporary, more modern, more sexually revealing as well. In doing so, this reinforces this notion of a binary opposition, that Beyonce, a black woman, is wearing an antebellum dress, reinforces this idea of a binary opposition between black and white people. But here, Beyonce is not trying to reinforce racial hierarchies, but she's trying to challenge racial hierarchies. Now, whether or not she's successful in this, you're going to need to come to your own conclusions. And you might also decide that this is completely over the top, that this is completely unnecessary. We also know as well from the previous videos that this video relies heavily on polysemic interpretations. Quite frankly, you're only going to get this historical context if you know your history. And if you're watching this video, perhaps especially as a British person who might not have this same knowledge of American history, we would perhaps just see these as being exciting costumes. So if you want to look into this in more detail, do check out the Media Studies blog at lr-media.blogspot.com and you can check out a link in the uh, on this uh, channel as well. Uh, so for example, there's an article there on charity advertising and this idea of a white savior, this idea of placing a white celebrity uh, in an impoverished African country. Uh, and also the very unpleasant and often uncomfortable uh, expectations that charity adverts place onto the white target audience, reinforcing this idea of a vulnerable and often pathetic uh, black audience, a uh, black group of people who need to be saved. Um, so do check that out on the blog.